Maybe I can spotlight myself. There we go. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Welcome back to the Eating the Past video series, which is the collaboration between Utah State University's Merrill Kazira Library Special Collections and Archives and the History Department housed in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Utah State University is a land grant university for the state of Utah and resides on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands in Willow Valley of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. I'm Jennifer Duncan, the book curator for our special collections unit. And also joining us tonight as a part of the Eating the Past team are Alex Bullocks Reese, a graduate of the USU History Master's program and our production coordinator, and Braden Wright, our special collections library peer mentor. As a reminder, our series focuses on recipes taken from and inspired by the cookbook collections at the Utah State University Special Collections and Archives, which we use not only to document the history of the Intermountain West, but also to provide broader primary source literacy through the study of food waste and culinary history. All previous events have been posted to library guides. And if I can get either Alex or Braden, um, one of you guys can um, post our LibGuide, um, then any of you can uh, go out and look at our previous episodes. We have the recordings there, the book information, all the recipes, so you can browse those at your convenience. Um, and on that guide, you will also find a link to our companion radio show, Eating the Past, which is sponsored by Utah Public Radio. Tonight, we've titled our episode, Cooking with a Conscience, and we're focusing on recipes that demonstrate the capacity individuals demonstrate for caring for one another in times of need or crisis. Two Utah State University scholars, one from the Department of History and one from the Department of English, will focus on global events at the beginning and end of the 20th century and how food became a way in which to think about the greater good. As you have questions or comments tonight, please put them in the Q&A. And just uh, I wanna acknowledge to everyone, this is the first time we're recording this as a webinar format. So um, I hope that we, we, we're gonna be working and kind of experimenting with the Q&A, but go ahead and use the, the bar across the bottom to put in a Q&A if you've got questions. Um, and we'll, we'll address those uh, probably at the end of the show. First up will be Dr. Tammy Proctor, who's a distinguished professor of history. Tammy will be preparing a molasses cake and then Dr. Evelyn Funda, Professor Emerita from the Department of English will jump forward several decades to talk about a 1970s recipe for rye bread. Thank you everyone for joining us um, tonight. And let's see if I can get the slides going, I will introduce our first book. Thanks, Brayden. Uh-oh. Of course, now I've got to get back over here. Okay. Okay. We are going, let's see, next slide. I'm going to go ahead and start in with my slides. Perfect. Um, we are going back. Let's see. Oops. Nope. Sorry. Sorry. Tonight, Timmy will be preparing a recipe for molasses cake reprinted in a small pamphlet entitled Corn which is published by the United States Food Administration, a federal agency operational between 1917 and 1920, created to control food production and distribution during and immediately after World War I. The tagline on this publication reads, eat less wheat, get into the corn line. The recipes in the pamphlet were in turn taken from a 1914 edition of the Farmer's Bulletin, a publication of the United States Department of Agriculture. And it is this publication on which I would briefly like to focus because it has an interesting connection with Utah State University. Um, Braden, if I can get the next slide. We are going back all the way to 1862 when President Abraham Lincoln signed a series of laws focusing on promoting agricultural development, including the establishment of the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, which he called the People's Department, um, the Homestead Act, the funding and the funding of the Transcontinental Railroad. Finally, Lincoln also in, also in 1862 signed the Morrill Act, which forged a new partnership between the federal government and higher education. This act set aside federal lands to create colleges to quote, benefit the agricultural and mechanical arts and funded the construction of agricultural colleges like Utah State University. The state of Utah did not found its land grant at USU for another 25 plus years until after the Federal Hatch Act was signed into law in 1887 establishing the system of agricultural experiment stations in conjunction with land grant universities, which together and to this day conduct applied agricultural research at state agricultural colleges. 
The Utah State Agricultural College was established by an act of the territorial legislature in March of 1888, and Jeremiah Sanborn first accepted a position as the director of the experiment station, and then later was the first president of the college. Can I get the next slide? Our university archives collections document USU history in detail. And these images are from our cyanotype collection, which document the early history of our campus in photos. Some of you will recognize the building to the left as the house just to the north of our old main building. And this is the original residence of Jeremiah Sanborn. And I have to admit, I, I always walk up Old Main Hill every morning. And for many years, I wondered, whose initials are ES? And now I know it's not really who, but what? It stands for Experiment Station. And on the right, you will see his office, which is filled with publications from the US Department of Agriculture. Um, next slide. So undoubtedly, one of these publications was the Farmer's Bulletin, from which Tammy will prepare her recipe tonight. Today, we house these materials in the federal um, in our federal documents collection, which is a subunit of special collections located on the lower level of the Merrill Kazir Library. Beginning in 1889 and for more than 100 years afterward, the USDA Farmers Bulletin was a critical source of practical and non-technical information for agriculturalists, providing research from the agricultural experiment stations to the general public. Information ranged from animal and soil science to practical advice for those living in a rural community, including cooking and recipes. And of course, today experiment stations, including those at USU, are still very much involved in traditional agricultural research, but their work is broadly applicable to a variety of matters related to the challenges of rural life, from environmental management to small business development to cooking and wellness. And experiment stations, as well as USDA publications, continue to be acquired and preserved in special collections and archives in the Merrill Library. So now I'll go, over, go ahead and hand our presentation over to Tammy. Braden, you can advance the slide um, as I come in here. Oh, can you see me now? All right. Um, well, thanks, Jennifer. And yes, it was kind of fun to do a recipe that has such a close tie to the university and to the experiment stations and the extension service. Um, but what I want to focus on is the role that uh, U.S. abundance has had in providing food uh, really for the last 125 years uh, to other parts of the world. And World War I was a really key moment in this um, movement to try to uh, particularly move surplus food to places where there were famines, um, a lot of people suffering from the effects of war, uh, and later, of course, to development programs around the world. So um, I am going to cook the corn molasses cake from Farmer's Bulletin number 565. I'll show you the recipe in a bit, um, but let me give you a little bit of background. So Braden, can you advance to the next slide? Most Americans would probably be surprised to know that during World War I, Herbert Hoover, later president of the United States, was known as the great humanitarian and was seen as a kind of um, uh, saver of the world. Some, some called him a food dictator. He, um, in the fall of 1914, headed a project to provide food to Belgium and parts of Northern France that were occupied by the Germans um, during the war. And you can see here some of the promotional literature that was uh, sent to Americans to try to get them to donate money, to send clothing, and eventually to save um, products that could be sent abroad. Um, the, this picture shows Hoover here in the middle of, um, as you can see, a large number of men who were involved in the, um, in the Commission for Relief in Belgium, which was the, the project. Uh, next slide, please. Now, during the, the war, especially before the United States entered in 1917, a, a group of Americans were volunteers, some of them were paid workers in this program to feed Belgium. And we're not talking about a small program. This is one that at its height was feeding nine to million, 10 million people at a time. 
And uh, a lot of what was being sent were wheat uh, products, but you know, just bags of wheat and uh, wheat flour, but also other kinds of products. And it was particularly aimed to help children. So a lot of these were school feedings, but um, all different aspects of society were affected by the program. Uh, what's kind of touching and what's really interesting in the archives are these uh, flower sacks. So these are actually the sacks that the flower came in, which were then decorated often in gorgeous ways with lace, Belgian lace or embroidery to thank the United States. And then these were mailed back. Um, these are both from Hoover libraries. So these were sent directly to Hoover. Many of them were sent to Woodrow Wilson, the president at the time, uh, to US consuls, to other people who were involved in the feeding. And so there was kind of an interesting um, reciprocal relationship going on with Americans uh, donating money to the Belgian relief and then Belgians expressing gratitude and sending um, thanks in, in these ways. Uh, next slide. Now this is where um, Utah State comes into the story. So in April of 1917, the United States entered the war. And at that point, they couldn't run the Commission for Relief in Belgium anymore because they were not a neutral country. And so they, that changed their relationships with uh, occupied Belgium. And instead, uh, they turned their attention to helping the allies. And Wilson signed into law the creation of the US Food Administration, which had really unprecedented powers. Um, Hoover, who was named as the head of it, didn't use all these powers, but um, what he did was he focused on voluntary food conservation. And the idea was that um, he thought Americans didn't need rationing, that they would step up to this crisis and that they would save uh, wheat and meat and sugar and all the things that were needed on their own. Um, the US Food Administration partnered with the Department of Agriculture to try to produce more food and it was kind of a two-pronged effort. You know, the, the Food Administration wanted you to save things, save foods and, and products, and the Department of Agriculture wanted you to produce more. And what's kind of neat is that Frederick Champ, who's a Logan native, and um, the, the driveway up to Old Main is actually named after him. He was a trustee of the university and his papers are in our library. He was a member of the US Food Administration in Washington working under Hoover during the war, uh, later, he actually went to the Near East to, as part of the relief uh, program there in, um, among Armenian refugees. So there's a nice USU connection. Uh, next slide, please. So imagine that you're, you know, uh, a woman who's in charge of the household in, in 1917 or 1918. Uh, you've been asked to have wheatless and meatless days each week. And you're being encouraged to use products that you might not be familiar with, or, or maybe you haven't used um, in a lot of dishes. The idea was to replace wheat with other kinds of grains, and corn was the big one that they were pushing. Um, this is from a couple of the pamphlets. Corn, it is the true American food. We have only to substitute corn, um, and it's another food just as good. So the idea was, you know, use corn when you might use uh, white flour. Well, the problem is like, how do you do that? <laughs> what, what kind of recipes can you cook? Um, and uh, so in the farmer's bulletin cake that I'm gonna make, there is no white flour at all. It's all cornmeal and whole wheat flour, which both were encouraged um, in households in World War I. And um, I like the way they try to encourage this for um, housewives. And I'll read this directly from the pamphlet again. Um, Americans can choose from among, you know, 50 new recipes, they're told. Uh, because corn isn't one food, it's a, it's a dozen, it's a cereal, it's a vegetable, it's a bread, it's a dessert. You can make anything with it. And you can kind of see from this slide some of the things that they were promoting. Um, next slide. Um, actually, video. Let's do video here. So here is the first part of the cake, and um, I'll let that speak for itself. Well, I'm making molasses corn cake, and 
This is a recipe from Farmer's Bulletin number 565, which was available free from the Department of Agriculture. And it's made in a couple of stages. The main thing you need to do is set up a double boiler on the stove, which I will be using momentarily. And this is uh, the top part of the double boiler. So um, into this pan, you just put seven ingredients. It's pretty easy. Um, two cups of cornmeal and I'm using a fine cornmeal. I tried this once with a medium or a coarser grain and it was a little chewy. So I think the fine's going to be better. So two cups of the yellow cornmeal, a half a cup of sugar, a teaspoon of salt, which I'll put in in a second, um, two tablespoons of butter, a half a cup of molasses, and then, this is kind of interesting, um, a cup of regular milk and a cup of buttermilk or sour milk. And particularly since I'm making this at altitude, it works better with the buttermilk added anyway. So it's good that that's already part of the recipe. So this all goes in the top of the boiler and uh, you cook it for 10 minutes and then let it cool. So in the top of the double boiler, you want to stir it until the butter melts and it gets hot. And when it's hot, you cook it on the stove for 10 more minutes. Okay. Um, can I get the slides back, Brayden? Okay, great, thanks. So we'll be coming back to um, find out what happens with this um, mess that I was making on the stove. Um, but I want to emphasize here that, again, the mixture of like sugar and molasses was a way of saving sugar. Um, it would have been pretty easy to get access, I think, to molasses and to sugar in, in Cache Valley because of the sugar beet um, production here. But there were a lot of wartime restrictions on products that were needed. So, you know, even though it was all voluntary, um, it wasn't always easy to get what you wanted. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the war ends in 1918, but instead of ending the programs, um, the United States pivots and they, they pivot for two reasons. One, um, there are widespread shortages and um, really hungry people in many parts of Europe, um, especially children. And there was a lot of concern about what would happen to children going forward if they didn't have access to food. Um, and frankly, you know, for Hoover and many of the other um, political elites at the time, they were worried about revolution. Uh, they didn't want hungry people overthrowing their governments. And so um, food was kind of a political tool also to try to stave off um, communist revolution in particular. Um, the other reason is that because the US had ramped up so much in production, they had all these surpluses that they had to get rid of. And uh, Europe seemed like a great place to, to uh, offload some of this material. And so they continued the program under a new agency called the American Relief Administration, which again, Hoover leads. So, you know, he's the, um, the connector throughout this. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this map is a really interesting one, I think, the hunger map of Europe, because it was published in most major newspapers in the United States um, in 1918. And you'll notice that the date on this is uh, Christmas. So right at the holidays, there was this appeal to people to not forget about the war sufferers in Europe, even though the war was over. And um, particularly for some of the former enemy countries, the blockade continued until the treaty was signed. And so uh, there was a lot of um, food, fuel, clothing shortages to be dealt with. And you can see some images here of kids who were suffering from diseases related to malnutrition um, and kids lined up to get 
their food aid. So uh, Americans were asked to continue to voluntarily save wheat, save meat, and to give to these programs and um, you know keep keep cooking with corn basically. Um, so next slide. And a lot of organizations got involved here. I want to make it clear that we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people um, donating money to these causes, uh, helping buy packages for relatives in Europe. Um, this is an ad from the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, which did a lot of work in Europe. Uh, so did the Quakers, so did uh, the American Red Cross, the YMCA, um, just about every major charity you can think of was involved in this. And here's the recipe for the cake. Um, and if we want to play the second video, this is probably a good time. After it's cooled from the double boiler, it looks like this, and it's kind of thick like um, malta meal or um, something, <laughs> something like a hot cereal. And at that point, you're going to add a mixture of whole wheat flour with baking soda, and the soda is the rising agent in this particular cake. Uh, but you do need to mix them together before you put them in so you don't get little pockets of soda. So that's going to go into the cornmeal molasses mixture. And you're going to stir it up pretty good. And the last ingredient that goes in is a beaten egg. And in this case, you want to make sure that your mixture is cool enough that you're not going to scramble the egg when you put it in. So I'm just going to stir this a little longer to get the flowers in. And it's still a little warm to the touch, but I think it's going to be okay if I stir it in quickly. So. And that's the last ingredient in the cake. And it starts to sound a little um, like it's slurping, which I assume is a good sign. And then what I'm gonna do is put it, it, it says in the recipe um, to put it in a shallow tin, which I'm taking to mean this nine by nine square pan. It also says to bake it. Doesn't give you a temperature or a time. But in my testing phase, I determined that 350 for 45 minutes seems to work pretty well. So that is what I'm going to do. And you'll see it's pretty thick when it comes out. I've got some little pieces that are not mixed up that I'm going to have to mix in the pan a little, but that'll be all right. It's got kind of a rough texture on top, but it'll smooth out when it bakes. So the finished product will come up next. Great, thanks. Um, while Brayden's putting up the slide, so I'll just say that, um, again, basically millions of people <laughs> were fed through American programs uh, that started at the end of the war and mostly ended um, five years later. So um, some of them were earlier, some of them were later. Next slide. Maybe. There we go. Um, and once again, there was kind of an outpouring of thank yous. Um, and I was telling uh, some of the others earlier that there are thousands of these in American archives. Um, the ones in the Library of Congress, uh, there's probably at least 5,000 to Woodrow Wilson alone. Many of them beautifully illustrated like this. Um, some of them you can tell like a whole class of school kids were asked to write the same letter to, <laughs> to thank the Americans for the food. Uh, but many of them are quite um, 
uh, personal too. And uh, these are just a few uh, that I wanted to show you. Um, last slide. So um, here's one more. This one's one of my favorites of um, Quakers delivering the food and they have their little Quaker outfits on, um, on, the, on the trolley, which is kind of fun. The American Relief Administration projects ended around 1924 for the most part. Um, but I wanted to mention that this becomes the precedent for programs really up until the present day. Um, Hoover again led a famine survey at the um, request of President Truman after World War II. Again, food aid was um, sent to Europe. A lot of you are probably familiar with the Marshall Plan, but there were other food programs, um, many of them actually sponsored by the Department of Agriculture again or by its subsidiaries. So, um, you know, this sets up a, um, a precedent for American generosity abroad. It's, it's many of the people who worked in these programs then became the uh, founding members of institutions like CARE and UNICEF. Um, now, what's interesting is in the 1960s, there was kind of a 50 year retrospective about these programs and it was called Hunger in America. And it juxtaposed this generosity abroad, this, this tradition of giving away abundance with the fact that in the 1960s, there were millions of hungry children in the United States. And um, so it really does kind of come back to this notion of um, cooking with a conscience and thinking about the food that you eat. Um, so last video just shows you the finished product. Okay, so this is the finished cake and as you can see, it looks a little bit rough on the top. Um, but you can smooth it in, in advance if you would rather. Um, there are a couple variations listed in the recipe. One of them is to turn it into a kind of ginger bread. So you just add ginger to the dry ingredients at the beginning. The other is to make it into an orange flavored cake. But this is just the plain corn molasses cake as it is. So I'm going to cut it so we can see what it looks like inside. It almost looks like a devil's food cake, but it doesn't have any chocolate. Mm -hmm. Bon appetit! So thanks, I'll turn it over to Jennifer for the, the next part of the presentation. And looking forward to questions. <laughs> Super, thanks Tammy. And I just wanna tell everyone I had a chance to taste this and it, I really enjoyed it. It's not super sweet at all because it does just, it's based with a, a molasses sweetener, but it's actually quite pleasant. Um, I think I would like it with a tiny dollop of whipped cream. And I think that would, um, I think that would make it just a really pleasant dessert for anyone. Um, so Brayden, if I can get the next slide, we're gonna, we're gonna move along. And um, next up, we do have Dr. Evelyn Funda but um, Tammy and Evelyn and I all decided that we wanted to take this opportunity of eating and during eating the past this week to promote um, an organization at Utah State University that um, does some really great work trying to address um, student food insecurity here on our campus. Um, it's an organization called Student Nutrition Access Center or SNAC, um, and it's the location of the USU Food Pantry. And their mission is to assist any Aggie who experiences difficulty accessing nutritious foods or personal care products. Um, it's really difficult to think about, but many of our USU students struggle to pay for food. Uh, we've got relatively high cost of living here in Cache Valley. Textbooks are expensive. There are a lot of costs associated with attending university. Um, in fact, during the last academic year, 2020, 2021, there were over 9,700 visits and orders filled by um, Snack Food Pantry. Volunteers there work really hard to stock and deliver meals. Since January 2021, um, more than 28,000 pounds of food have been recovered and diverted to feed Snack Patrons. Uh, you know, it's really hard to be a student, 
and it's hard for students to do their best work when they're struggling to afford food. So in the spirit of being community spirit, spirited, um, Eating the Path team is asking everybody on the call tonight uh, or anyone who's listening afterward to consider making a donation to Snack this month to support all their good work. And um, if I can get Alex to put the Snack link in the chat, that'd be great, thank you. Um, and this link is also available from our lip guide, so you can always go back and get it later. Um, okay, so now we're on to our next recipe. So Brayden, if you can go ahead and, and advance the slide. Super, okay. Um, the 1960s and 1970s witnessed the growth of mass social movements focused on improving global welfare. Within the environmental movement, vegetarianism grew in popularity as a way to address both environmental impacts of meat production, as well as a way to confront global food scarcity. Books such as Francis Moore Lape's 1971 bestseller, Diet for a Small Planet, which was recently released with a 50th anniversary edition, having sold millions of copies, argued that better food policy could address global hunger. Said Lape, this book is about protein, how we as a nation are caught in a pattern that squanders it and how you can choose the opposite, a way of eating that makes the most of the earth's capacity to supply this vital nutrient. Um, the famous Moosewood cookbook focused on creative vegetarian cooking food that was ecologically and globally sustainable while still being tasty. Um, and this work is now one of the top 10 best-selling cookbooks of all time, according to the New York Times. USU owns an original 1974 spiral bound self-published edition of this work. Um, though the more common version that you're probably, most many of you have probably seen or may even own was first published in 1977. Uh, next slide. Tonight, Evelyn will be cooking from Doris Jansen Longacre's More With Less Cookbook, which was originally published in 1976. During the 1970s, the Mennonite Central Committee, Committee or MCC, made a request of Christians in the US and Canada to reduce their food budgets by 10% as a response to global hunger and overconsumption at home. This cookbook was born from the idea that Mennonite communities wanted to respond to this call, but weren't really sure how to begin or maintain this motivation. Doris Longacre was associated with the MCC and authored the More With Less cookbook as a response to this challenge, having done Mennonite missionary work in Vietnam and Indonesia in the mid 1960s and 1970s. Said Longacre in the preface to the original edition, we are looking for ways to live more simply and joyfully, ways that grow out of our tradition, but take their shape from living faith and the demands of the hungry world. The recipes in this work focus more on grains and other vegetarian sources of protein, as well as foods from diverse cultures, foods that are sustainable to produce for a global population. Um, next slide. The USU Special Collections copy of this book is a 1998 printing, when over 630,000 copies were already in circulation. Um, this book has remained in print and was republished with a 40th anniversary edition in 2016. So it is still readily available today. And in fact, when I pulled this book from our closed stack area, one of um, our junior faculty members stopped me and asked me what I was doing with it and told me that she had received a copy as a wedding gift just a few years ago. So it's, it's still very common. Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and hand off to Evelyn now and she can tell us about a delicious rye bread that she prepared. Brayden, could you advance the slide, please? So here's a picture of Doris Longacre. Um, I actually came across this book back in the 1990s when I was in graduate school uh, in Nebraska. And of course, during that time period, I uh, was looking for cheaper ways to feed, um, feed myself and my, my husband then. And so I bought this book for 50 cents at a thrift store. Now, I want to mention to you, though, that um, while this book is about cheap eats, it's about more than that as well. It's actually a real artifact of the 1970s um, as a specific moment in time. It's kind of an artifact of the socio-geopolitical, political, political um, swirling soup of global kinds of issues. Next slide, please. Doris Longacre's raison d'etre for writing the book was less about thrift directly and more about addressing the bigger issue of world hunger. 
And it was published during a dec decade when uh, numerous cookbooks were focusing on cooking with the conscience. Their fundamental philosophies address the global environmental human health implications of modern food production. And they promoted food choices that were more ecologically sound, healthy, natural, humanely sourced, and, soci and socially conscious. This was also, by the way, the decade that um, in an earlier episode of Eating the Past, we had um, featured Alice Waters and the fact that she opened during the 1970s, Chez Panisse. And during the 70s, she became truly a food advocate who uh, advocated with moralistic zeal the, the idea of what she called simple foods. Now, whether her foods are simple or not, that's up for debate. But she was trying to get us away from the highly processed food of the changing food season of the 1970s. Think jello food um, poke cakes. You may remember that, or Hamburger Helper, which was introduced in the 1970s, or the infamous cheese ball. Next slide, please, Braden. So let me give you a few examples of this geopolitical kind of background that's going on um, behind Doris Longacre's book. First of all, the world population estimates had doubled in the 50 years between 1923 and 1973. In 1968, Stanford University professor Paul Ehrlich and his wife Anne published the book, The Population Bomb, which predicted worldwide famine, pollution, ecological collapse, as well as major social upheavals um, coming over the next two decades uh, due to overpopulation. It was one of the most influential books of the entire 20th century. And it was a lightning rod for criticism, but it still drew attention to this overpopulation kinds of pro uh, problem. Next slide, please. Indeed, world hunger was very much in the news during the 60s and the 70s with serious famines in, on the African continent and South Asia with almost 20 million deaths in the 60s and 70s. And as Jennifer mentioned, Mennonite cooperative relief groups were on the ground across the globe. And uh, Doris Longacre and her husband, Paul, were um, doing food, food relief efforts in both uh, Vietnam and Indonesia. Next slide. Another couple of factors that I've got here uh, represented are the mounting global inflation problems that is linked then to the massive crop failures globally as well. Um, in particular, I mentioned the, the Russian global, um, the, the Russian crop failures in 1971 and 1972. Um, in, in their crop failures, they ended up creating um, a, an agreement with the US to buy grain. And of course, their, their buying US grain meant that it only inflated our global inflation food prices even further. So it just was sort of this circular problem that was going on. Next slide, please. There were efforts to try to address food security. Um, the green revolution in agriculture was leading for the development of new crop varieties that increased yield, um, created uh, uh, drought resistant varieties of grains. And here at the top, you see Norman Borlaug um, who won the Nobel prize for a robust wheat variety that was drought resistant and he developed that in Mexico. However, agriculture um, after the war had also become more reliant on chemical pesticides which Rachel Carson had pointed out in her 1962 book, Silent Spring. And then the another factor of the of 70s is the agricultural pollution was only one of the environmental problems that was facing the brand new uh, founded uh, agency, the Environmental Protection Agency. And all of this is to say that Doris Longacre's More With Less cookbook was a reflection of pretty turbulent times. So next slide, please. Now, before I give you more context on Long Acres book itself, let's get some dough rising. Um, my choice for my recipe was actually inspired from a passage of Long Acres book in which she writes, my mother raised our family on a wonderful, this is a quote, on a wonderful solid homemade loaves of Prussian Mennonite 
Rugenbrot, or rye bread. But once in a while, the supply ran out before baking day and store-bought white bread came to the table. I remember my teenage brother once took a slice, squashed it into a small soggy ball and pitched it across the room in front of mother to express his disdain. Mother accepted this as a compliment. Longacre went on to say that home-baked bread avoids the endless list of chemical additives in commercial bread and quote, in terms of taste appeal, nutritional value, and creative experience, the home-baked product is worth more than its dollars and cents value. Um, like Longacre, I grew up in a household where rye bread was actually our main uh, rye bread on the table. And I've baked many loaves of rye bread from my mother's rye bread recipe. So I wanted to see whether or not this recipe uh, was comparable. I, I've made some altitude changes, which I'll talk about. You'll also note that I'm gonna be using a bread machine. And um, I choose to use a bread machine rather than the KitchenAid standing mixer, mixer that I have, because it, for me, the rye bread is a sturdier dough. And so it just seems to work a little bit better when you're using um, the, the machine. Also the library guide for this episode has my high altitude version of this recipe. Um, also mentions how to bake it at lower than 3000 foot altitude. And then a note on how my own mother's recipe differs. So on to the next, on to the first um, part of the cooking demonstration. Start mixing. Um, there's a couple of things that I want to mention. One is that I bake at 4,700 feet altitude, so I've made some modifications here for that. Um, I put the original uh, amounts on the website um, so that you can take a look at those. But altitude creates some special difficulties for baking bread, and that's because the air pressure is a lot lower, so bread rises much faster. Um, it can mean it can overproof, which means that when you put it in the oven, it's going to fall and collapse and you're going to have a brick. So you don't want to have that. Also, in the drier clim climate that I live in, um, flour becomes an issue, so you have to sometimes modify how much flour it is. And this can be from recipe to recipe, from one time to cook it to another. So we just had a snowstorm, and who knows what, how much it's going to take today. You're also going to notice that I'm using a bread machine. Now, Doris Longacre would say absolutely no to that. She's very specific about um, saying that we spend too much money on specialized kitchen appliances. Um, my mother also made rye bread from scratch with hand kneading. They don't cook in my kitchen, therefore I'm gonna use what I wanna use. This is a bread machine that I use on a dough cycle, an hour and a half dough cycle. And so we'll start first with the um, flavoring and yeast ingredients. So what I've got is one and a half teaspoon of yeast, one and a half teaspoon of brown sugar, or you can do one and a half teaspoon of molasses, one and a half teaspoon of salt, a tablespoon of butter that's softened. If you're doing this by hand, I would suggest that you actually um, melt this butter. That makes it come together a little easier. Then I also have something that Doris Longacre doesn't have in her recipe and that is caraway seed. Um, I grew up on rye bread that had to have caraway seed in it, so for me, that's a non-negotiable. So this is a tablespoon of caraway seed. So I'm gonna put all of these into my bread machine. I don't have to do anything else to them right now. And then I'm gonna add my liquids. So the liquid, a cup of water, Warm water if you um, are doing it by hand. In my bread machine, it has a slight warming kind of part of the cycle, and so I don't need to put warm water in there. I can just put regular, and then half a cup of milk. And I've used 2%, I've used skim, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. All right, so there's our liquids, and now our flours. And I wanna say a word about the flours that I'm using. Um, I'm actually, these are flours that come from local source comes from Central Mill um, here in town. You can order online at Central Mill and pick it up. They've got a zillion kinds of flowers. They've got specialty flowers, um, spelt and barley flowers, etc. So both of my flowers are actually coming from Central Milling. 
and they do ship if you don't live in Logan. So this is a dark organic rye flour. So that's a cup of that. And then this is an all purpose flour. This one happens to be, let me think if I can get the name straight. Artisan Baker's Craft Plus All Purpose Flour. Okay. So this is three, I've got three cups of flour in here right now. I'm actually gonna pull out about a quarter cup of the flour just so that I can make those adjustments as the dough um, begins to knead. So this then is about two and three quarters cup of flour. Just goes in. I've got it on the dough cycle. So here it's, it's beginning to knead, and you'll notice that it's still a mess. What we want is a dough that is um, soft, but it holds its shape and smooth. So, and oftentimes I'll come in here with the spatula. This looks pretty good. I may just leave out that extra quarter of a cup, but I'm just going to keep um, kneading it, and we'll see what it looks like. So, uh, Brayden, yes. And can we get the next slide, please? And while Brayden's doing that, um, you will you may have noticed that that bread really did start to come together at that very last moment. I did, however, end up uh, using a, like a heaping tablespoon of flour added to it to get the kind of smooth texture that I wanted for that bread. So a little bit about the, the context of the cookbook itself. Doris Longacre was actually commissioned to write More With Less cookbook by the Mennonite Central Committee, um, who in the early 70s had made that call to focus their relief and service efforts on world food needs. As Longacre writes, as Jennifer mentioned, the church directed each constituent to look at its lifestyle, particularly its food habits, with the goal to eat and spend 10% less than they were normally and thereby they would address North Americans overabundance in relation to the world food crisis with a program of responsible eating. And you can see this theme here in images and quotes from the book. A, a call for recipes went out to Mennonite periodicals um, and to the readers in, in, all, all across the globe. Doris Longacre was then heading up the effort and she and a team of 30 home economics uh, uh, home economists vetted and tested each of the recipes and uh, tested over a thousand recipes from the many thousand that came in. And then she, Long, Doris Longacre, chose the books, chose the recipes that were printed in the book um, based on economy of time, money, energy, as well as foods related to good health and dishes prepared from simple basic ingredients. Now throughout the book, Longacre also offers information on daily food requirements, nutritional breakdowns, cost of protein sources, information on world uh, food supply trends. The recipes are interspersed like they are here with inspirational quotes, uh, time-saving tips, and also advice for gathering up fragments, which is the term she uses. In other words, using leftovers. Additionally, what's interesting too is there's also an emphasis on international recipes. Um, she got recipes from all over the globe. And when I did my count, I found more than 40 countries, ethnic groups, or unique regions represented in the book. Next slide, please. Having just celebrated its 40th year in print with an anniversary edition, the More With Less cookbook is as Jennifer mentions, very popular today. In her review of the recent edition, Marlene Epp, who is a Canadian professor of history and peace and conflict studies, um, writes that the cookbook, quote, has possibly educated more people around the world about Mennonite values and beliefs than any book of their history or theology. Longacre's culinary politics are at the very forefront of a, food, of a food sustainability revolution that's even more relevant today. Next slide, please, Braden. 
Some of Longacre's text that supplements the recipes confronts the reader with the cold hard truth of our cooking and eating habits. She argues that our food habits are out of balance with other countries. At that time in 1976 or 1974, when she was compiling the book, the average North American used five times as much grain per person yearly as people living in poor countries. Now that also included indirect um, uses of grain like meat and also alcohol. Our consumption of meat and sugar, which were still climbing in the 1970s, far exceeded trends in other countries. And she said that we overeat sugar, what a surprise. At that time, North Americans ate over 120 pounds of sugar uh, per year. Um, that number today is actually 152 pounds yearly, or what is equivalent to six cups of sugar a week that we eat. So as you can see, this is a, an ethical issue for her. During the 1970s, Longacre writes, uh, the average American household spent 16 to 18% of their take home pay on their food. And at the same time, uh, in third world countries, they were spending 70 to 80% of their uh, funds on food. And that's in normal times. That's not in famine times. That's in normal times. So as North Americans, um, Doris Grover, right, or Doris. Longacre writes, as North Americans, most of us grew up believing that we were born into an era of abundance. The ability to buy something has meant the right to have it. We try to turn eating into a, what she calls, super experience. That is, an ex with expensive, exotic, out-of-season ingredients and an endless variety of menus. We spend money and hours shopping for gourmet foods to be cooked in specialized cookware, like the waffle iron, the fondue pot, the rice cooker, and the bread machine. So Longacre sums this up with this question, questions. Uh, how can we continue to overeat in the face of starvation and be at peace with ourselves and our neighbors? The destitute suffer, suffer physically, the overindulged morally. So now on to part two and uh, ending with the, the slicing of the rye bread. So at the end of the hour and a half bread dough cycle um, in the machine, this is what the bread ought to actually look like. It has come up, it's nice and fluffy. You can see there's a, some spring to it. Um, and so I'm gonna take it out just dump it out on a lightly floured surface. Be sure to find the paddle and take the paddle out if you're using a bread machine. And then I'm just going to shape it. And I put a video, um, a link to a video on the recipe that comes from Keating Flour about how to shape a loaf of bread. Um, you can just sort of see what I'm doing. did this, um, I'm going to cut some slits in it so that it can expand easily um, during the next rising. And this is a, a, a knife that I've got, a utility knife that I've got that I only use for rye bread. So it's just my, my bread. Okay, just like little ones. You can already see it kind of rising. And then I do a quick pan. and I cover it. Now, at this point, the second rising is only gonna take 20 to 25 minutes. Um, and this is where I really watch it pretty carefully because I wanna make sure that it doesn't overproof at which point it will collapse in the oven. So I don't want that to happen. 
So what I often do is at this point, I will go and turn on my oven and let make sure that my oven is ready the minute I think this thing is ready. This has been rising for about 20 minutes. Um, it has doubled. I don't want to let it rise in the pan any more than this, but I promise that once I put it in the oven, it's going to continue to rise. If I let it rise on outside of that oven, it's going to fall. So if this is about the right time to put it in the oven. 350, we're going to bake it for 45 minutes um, and then reveal. So this is what the bread looks like after you've taken it out of the oven. Um, it, this is a nice rise on it. You can see a nice kind of um, brown golden. It should sound a little hollow. And I also, when I take it out of the oven, I will either have melted butter or I'll have a stick of butter and uh, butter the top of it just for an added little bit of flavor. I'm going to cut it for you and I'm going to actually do something that my mother always did with a fresh loaf of bread and that is to bless it with three little cuts. So three crosses, scratch it in, there's blessed, and let's take a look. Now this bread is um, great fresh. If it's, if it's warm while you're cutting it, I would suggest using an electric knife. If um, it's cool, this one's a little bit cooler. If it's cool, then you can use a regular knife. Um, I also suggest the next day cutting in thin slices, toasting it. It makes the best crunchy, kind of almost cracker-like recipe uh, of toast. So there you have the rye bread. And Brayton, can you give me the next slide, please? So before the segment, I gave you a glimpse of the cookbook's rather challenging, um, con confrontational sort of attitude uh, about cooking with a conscience, but the book also strives to be inspirational. And so I just wanna end with this little poem here at the top of the, the page that has the rye bread recipes on it, where she writes, and, and I'm pretty sure this is Longacre herself. She says the author's unknown, but I think it's her. There is so much beauty in bread, beauty of sun and soil, beauty of patient toil. Wind and rains have caressed it. Christ often blessed it. So be gentle when you touch your breath. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ellen. Um... I just want to tell everyone how delicious Evelyn's bread is. Also, she didn't mention it. Another wonderful little thing is to add some apricot jam with this rye bread, and it is really, really special. Um, Alex Bullock Reese is going to field our Q and A tonight. Um, but Brayden, if I could get the the last slide in the presentation one more time, um, just so everyone remembers that we have this wonderful organization on our campus, um, the Student Nutrition Access Center. Um, the three of us have made contributions to this organization today, and we once again hope everyone else will consider doing so as well. It's a really wonderful uh, group on campus. They're also looking for volunteers. So uh, if any of you are USU folks, uh, you might wanna consider reaching out to them. Um, and with that, I'm gonna let Alex field our Q&A tonight. Um, she wants to pop up. It looks like we've got a couple already in the queue, a couple of questions already in the queue. Yeah, um, so our first question is from Dan McInerney and it's for Tammy. And first he says that he likes the bag of Tostinos on the top of your fridge. Um, <laughs> me too, I'm a big Tostitos person. <laughs> Um, and then he asks, a non-historical question, would you explain why buttermilk helps our recipes when we cook at high altitude? Um, yeah, so I don't know all the science behind it, but um, I do have this really great altitude baking book that uh, talks about buttermilk. And I think it's the acidity in the buttermilk that helps um, depress some of the features that Evelyn was talking about. It keeps the 
Uh, the rise from happening too fast, it keeps the baked good from drying out. And so this, um, this cookbook I have, which is called Pie in the Sky, has buttermilk in just about every cake recipe and in some of the uh, bread recipes as well. And I don't know, Evelyn, if you've used buttermilk in your recipes, but it does seem to work pretty well. Yeah, I don't really um, normally use the butter. The, the typical principles that I'm using when I adjust for altitude are, are to grease, decrease the yeast and um, be careful about the flour, about the, the liquids. Um, and it seems to work. Awesome. So our next question is also from Dan McInerney. Um, and it's for Evelyn. Uh, Dan asks, did Longacre's moral and ethical guidance on food extend to advice about health or the medical problems of overconsumption? She does talk about, I mean, she, the book is very moralistic in between the chapters. Um, and she does talk about some of those things, but she also talks about that in her second book, which was actually published posthumously. She died shortly after, um, I think in the 1980. Uh, she died of cancer at a very young age, but posthumously her book, what is it, Tammy? Um, Living with Less, isn't that right? I, I can't remember, but there's I a second book, which I, I also have. Yeah. yeah, it's called Living with Less, and it's really about lifestyle kinds of questions and um, attitudes about particularly, I mean, she takes a, a lot of hits at North Americans, um, Canadians as well, because the, the Mennonites were really a sort of North American, Can American Canadian kind of group. Um, and um, yeah, so yes, the answer is yes. And I just wanna add that, um... Evelyn said she got her book in the 90s. I we, we kind of bonded over this because I also got the book in the 90s when I was in graduate school, but I bought it at a little shop in um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania at an Amish shop. And I too was looking for cheap cooking, you know, for my graduate school kitchen um, for Todd and I. So um, yeah, we, we both have kind of dog-eared copies of, of this book. We need to get a copy for Alex before she heads out to grab school. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> well, and Tammy, you you actually bought it a lot closer to where uh, Long Acre actually lived, which was in Akron, Pennsylvania. So yeah. Um, so our next question is from Jamie Sanders and it's for Tammy. Um, Jamie says, I thought some Europeans considered corn more of a food fit for feeding livestock, or at least it was not part of their usual diet. Did the US ever try to promote corn to Europe or did food rescue organizations mostly export wheat? Uh, great question, Jamie. And yes, uh, they did try to send cornmeal and tried to uh, create recipes that were what we would call multigrain that included cornmeal. But Europeans did keep um, rejecting it and sending it to, um, to be fed to the animals. Uh, there was also a problem with shipping cornmeal because it more quickly became rancid than um, wheat flour. And so instead, they had to convince Americans. And it was kind of interesting because they hired, um, they actually hired a couple of um, African American women to run food demonstrations in New England um, to sh the, and basically, you know, to perform, uh, this is how you make cornmeal and it's a traditional Southern food and everyone should try it. And so they, you know, they tried to, to say, this is, this is an American food, it's not just a regional food and to, to teach Americans to appreciate cornmeal because it was also being used for feed here too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we don't have any other questions currently in the Q and A. Um, I, I actually have one question I just want to put out there. So, growing up, I always associated rye bread with being fancy. It seemed like a more like a delicacy, and so I'm kind of curious about um, 
rye bread as being seen as something that was more for a Spartan cooking environment. Wow. Um, <laughs> I had never heard that before. Um, I always see when I Alex grew up, and Braden are, are nodding along with me. <laughs> isn't that funny? So when I was growing up and remember, I grew up in rural Idaho where homemade, anything homemade, homemade clothes. I had homemade clothes, homemade bread was always sort of seen as, oh, those are the country folks. Those, those are not the town people. Those are the country folks. And so white bread was the thing that you wanted to have and um, store-bought clothes were the things that you wanted to have. Mm -hmm. So it, but of course, where my family came from, um, from the Czech Republic, it really was kind of the daily bread. It really was. I mean, my mother used to, to cook um, like seven loaves of bread in the morning. And then she would call people to come over for coffee. And we would be lucky by that evening to have a loaf of bread to have with our dinner because it, it was that popular. So all the neighbors would come and have coffee and take home a loaf of bread. I should say too, one thing that I mentioned to, to Jennifer and Tammy was that my mother's bread is actually cheaper to make than Doris Longacre's bread. My mother's bread does not have the butter in it, does not have the milk in it, and uses white sugar instead of brown sugar or molasses. So um, it's a very simple bread and it, it was very comparable, I think, right? To my typical bread. Well, it's interesting to me because I actually, I told you this, I actually preferred your mom's recipe and maybe it's just because you have such a hand with it and I don't know, but so it was interesting to me that this other recipe had the more fat and sweetener in it because usually I like fat and sweetener. <laughs> and milk. <laughs> I, I had just one reflection after listening to Evelyn's presentation too. I was thinking about how important um, in all of these programs, the government ones, as well as the, uh, the ones that Doris um, tapped into, the, the role of religion is so important because many of the Mennonites were involved in those food programs I was talking about. They, they were um, conscientious objectors in World War I. And so they actually went to France uh, with the Quakers to uh, deliver food and then uh, continued to do food aid throughout the period. And, you know, the Mennonites, the Quakers, but also all the main, mainline Protestant denominations came together to create the church world service after World War II. And, you know, I was just thinking when you were talking that there's, there's really kind of a long history to this that you can see right. in her book because she also has little Bible verses sprinkled throughout. And um, anyway, I just, it was something I was thinking about when you were talking. So I think Alex is correct. We don't have more questions, do we? No, we don't have okay. any. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for attending. I want to thank Evelyn and Tammy for, for contributing tonight and let everybody know that we have one more Eating the Past this spring uh, from our Zoom series. Um, it's February 24th. We've got Jeannie Sir from the Department of History and Utah Public Radio and Carrie Holt from the English Department. And we're actually gonna have Clint Pumphrey um, from Special Collections and Archives. They are going to be featuring the library's outdoor product catalog collection. And our show is gonna be titled Survival Cooking. I think they're actually gonna be cooking outside. It sounds a little scary, um, but it <laughs> should be fun. So I hope you guys will, will be able to join us then. And I'm going to stop the recording and